Let's go ahead and dive in. If you've ever been on one of my trainings before, I'm going to ask you to get into the chat. So let's just get warmed up. Give me one word. How are you feeling today? One word. How are you feeling today? Your energy attracts energy. So Mr. Sweeney, great. Thank you, sir. Woo. I like that one. Hello, Ms. Smith. Always nice to see you on these. Ms. Julia, Mr. Priam, very good, great, excited, tired. Ms. Ramos, we don't have time for that. Amazing, ready for the day, living the dream, awesome, very, very good. Okay, so today's conversation um, has absolutely nothing to do with marketing, and it has everything to do with management. And you know, I think that for the most part, us as martial artists and, and instructors, uh, you know, because we've been in the martial arts so long, like leading our students on the mat is one thing, but being able to lead and manage a team is completely different. So just so I can see kind of the size of teams that, that we have, can you let me know in the chat, how many team members do you have, whether it's part-time or full-time, how many team members do you have let's see what we're working with four one three nine five keep them coming guys none yet always like comma yet right 17 awesome two there we go mr concha all right um one of the you know one of my biggest lessons as i not only grew my team at Gracie Pack, I think at the height when we were offering after school and summer camps, uh, we had over 20 paid uh, part-time and, and full-time uh, employees. And then over at GrowPro, we actually just had our 34th employee start today. And I definitely downplayed the importance of building my leadership and management skills to build for like the team. Right. It's it's one thing, like I said, to be able to lead your students on the mat, completely kind of different skill set in, in terms of leading our employees and our staff. And uh, even if we do have staff members on here, this is completely relevant to you because more than likely you have some form of a direct report, whether it's a part time instructor and you're the head instructor and they're coming up to you or your program director. And this is something that I've really focused on a lot in terms of leveling up my managerial skills and my leadership skills. And I'm excited to, to share these five principles with you. And what we're also going to be doing as we going through is I'm going to ask you to rate yourself. Okay. I want you to get brutally honest with yourself on where you are at on a scale of one to five with the each with each of the individual principles. And by the end of this, what I'd like for you to do is the one that you kind of scored the lowest on, that should be your focus on implementing the tactical items that I'll give you to, to help you with this, okay? So let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, boom. All right, there we go. Thumbs up if you guys can see my screen. Are we good? Awesome. All right. Not in my normal office with uh, my, I have like three screens set up. So I'm just on a laptop. So I'll do the best job letting people in and, and getting in the chat. Um, thank you guys for being here and investing in your, uh, in your growth, right? We always want to have this growth mindset and that's what we are here to do today. So next 45 minutes, five principles of management, and more importantly, how can you implement them, right? I think one of my frustrations when I hop on webinars is sometimes you get like this 30,000 view up, you get like the mindset stuff, but you don't get the tactical strategies on, on how to implement what the person is teaching. And we're going to make sure that you have those tactical strategies um, today, okay? So we're going to talk about the hardest decision that we ever have to make in our our schools. We'll go into the five core principles. And after each principle, we will um, assess ourselves. And there's, you know, I, I, I do believe there's a difference between leadership and management. And we're really going to be focusing on the management part of it. And if you think of some of maybe you had previous jobs, like my very first job, I worked at Chuck E. Cheese. I made $5.50 an hour and I had to dress up as the rat. And uh, also 
I had to do the uh, the merchandising where the kids bring all of their tickets and then they want the little army man and the little bouncy ball. Talk about a great way to develop patience. And uh, I had a manager at that Chuck E. Cheese. His name was Steve. And he basically taught me the exact opposite way that I would want to manage people. And then I got a job at the martial arts school as the instructor and an amazing manager. And her name was Julia. And when I think of Julia and I think of her managerial style, there were a few things that she was really, really great at. She was really great at clear communication, right? I think we talk a lot about accountability and the importance of, of accountability, but accountability requires you to have clear communication with your team. I know there's been plenty of times in my life where I knew I need to have a, a hard conversation with an employee or maybe even with a friend or with a significant other, and we have a tendency to push it off, um, and that makes holding that person really – it makes it difficult to hold them accountable. So great managers have clear communication. They also have predictability, okay? Um, when I was first starting Gracie Pack, I'll be honest with you, I was not a great CEO, visionary. I was not a great manager or leader. Um, I was I was kind of like a dictator. I was running like a dictatorship and then was wondering why people didn't want to stick around for long periods of time. You need to be predictable. Your team needs to know every day when they come in, what are they getting? Who are they getting? The other thing is we've got to be encouraging. And uh, I was on a round table yesterday and we were talking about accountability and you know, I, I personally have struggled with, um, you know, like recognizing because to me, like, well, should I really recognize them for doing the job that I am paying them to do? Like the recognition is your paycheck. Like that's that's the mindset I, I used to have. And it's it's not the best one to have. So we got to be encouraging. We got to be fair. and We got to keep it real. OK, we got to be fair and we got to keep it real. And we want to be able to make a hard job fun. All right. We want to be able to make a hard job fun. And I think that is an interesting transition that happens when you have a student that maybe started with you when they were eight, nine, 10 years old, and now you're bringing them onto payroll. And now that relationship shifts because we are operating a business and it's not just all fun and games. And we've got to make sure that we are able to have that clear communication, to be predictable so they know what they're getting into, to encourage them to be fair and real. And to just when it is a hard day, when it is a long day, to still make sure it's fun. And that was probably one of my biggest lessons that I've learned uh, mentoring under Mr. Mike Metzger at Maya. If you've ever been to the like CMA headquarters or their office, they are always having a good time. Because think about it, just like our students, when martial arts isn't fun anymore, what's going to happen? They're going to quit, right? And we want to make sure that our employees and team members are having fun as well. So I shared this with my team members and I got really vulnerable with my team members and shared that this is the absolute hardest part for me as the owner of the business. And I basically drew out this framework here and you've got high performance on the left hand side, low performance on the uh, low low the bottom left quadrant and then we got low culture and high culture and every single one of your team members falls into one of these quadrants so as we go through this i want you to think of a team member as we go through each one and where they would fall in on that quadrant and the first one is if you have a team member that is high culture they're a high culture fit they you know live and breathe your core values and they're also a high performer. So think about somebody on your team right now that, man, you just absolutely love working with them. They, they're high culture. They're high performance. And when we have those people, we have to pay them well and we have to promote them. Because if you don't, they're going to go look somewhere else where they can be paid well and they can be promoted. The next area is somebody that's a high culture fit, but they might not be performing to our standards. And hopefully you have in writing what those standards are. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. But when you have somebody that's a high culture fit, but they're just not performing to your standards, this is where you've got to coach them up. You have to 
hold them accountable through having conversations. And we're going to talk about like meeting rhythm flows and conversations and how to have these hard conversations. And in some cases, they might just need to be in a different seat. Um, I had a my, my very first full time program director. Um, and I'm sure some of you can relate to this. His name was Brian. He was the father of two of my students, uh, Brian and Alejandro. And these two kids, they were just absolute studs on the mat. They were training there. They were there every day. They were helping with classes. And I needed help at the front desk. And I'm thinking, well, you know, Brian, like they, they've been with me. Their family has been with me for, for many, many years. And he knows like our programs and our prices. And I'm like, well, you're going to be my new program director. And it wasn't a great fit for him. But one of the things that I realized was that he was really, really great with the kids. And at that point, we were really going all in with after school and summer camp. So I moved him to a different seat to oversee the after school and summer camp where he absolutely flourished because he was a high culture fit. So if you do have somebody that's high culture but low performance, you got to coach them up, you got to hold them accountable, and then potentially put them in a different seat. The next one, and, and this is the easy one, right? If somebody's a low culture fit and they aren't performing, you got to let them go. And, you know, I've had to fire people. I'll, I'll never forget the first person I ever had to fire. He was an assistant instructor at Gracie Pack, and I was so nervous about it that I made my wife do it. And I'm not suggesting that you do it. Now, she worked in the school with me, but I asked her to lead the conversation because I was so nervous about it. And, you know, it's interesting, come to find out years later, like this was the absolute best thing, not just for us, but also for him, okay? Where the really hard, uh, the, the hardest decision that we often have to make is this here, where somebody is a low culture fit but they are a high performer. And if you've been in business for a while and you've, you've had employees, you've probably experienced this where, you know, maybe you have like a phenomenal instructor and they, they you know, they, they show up, they teach the class, the classes are phenomenal, but there are other aspects of their job and other responsibilities that they have that maybe they're refusing to do, or they just, they don't want to do it, or they don't agree with the changes that you want to make in your school. When somebody's a high performer, but they're not a culture fit, this is one of the hardest decisions that we have to make um, in, in our business. And one of the things that I always, like I, I, tr I always want to make sure that I do this, is I want to make sure that it truly is a people problem, and it's not a process problem. So if there's a challenge that you're having right now in your school, it's either a, a, a process problem, you don't have the proper process, or maybe you have the process, but it's in your head and you haven't put it down on paper, or maybe you have put it down on paper, but you never trained your team, or maybe you trained your team, but you only did it once, right? Like, guys, you have to train your team on a consistent basis. It can't just be once. And if it's a process problem, we want to fix the process. So I always ask myself when there is an issue with a particular person, is it a process problem or is it really a people problem? Because the hardest thing I think that we have to do is make that decision to eventually let, let people go. And what we'll go through today with these five core principles of, of management are the processes that you should make sure you have in place before you make that decision. Am I going to let somebody go? All right. So let's kick it off with core principle uh, of management number one. And this is expectations. And I think for most business owners, the expectations that they have, in, you know, have for their team or the standards that they have for their team is oftentimes in their head. And we got to get it out of our head. And there's a few different ways that you can set these expectations in your business. And all expectations are, are the verbalization. You have to verbalize how someone should act or something should be done. And there's four different ways that you can uh, set these expectations inside of your business. The first one is core values. The second one is your core focus. The third one are the expectations that you have at the departmental level, right? So the expectations you have for your instructor team are going to be different than the expectations that you have for your program director team or your summer camp team or your after school team. 
And then we have expectations at their individual role, right? If you have a chief instructor position, but you also have like part-time instructors and, and we use a, a pathway, we have like a level one part-time uh, assistant instructor, a level two, a level three, we have a senior instructor, and then we have a chief instructor. So you have to set these expectations in, in these four different places. And I think for many of you, you have these expectations, but they're in your head and, and they haven't been verbalized. So your core values, guys, you know, I think sometimes people roll their eyes, you know, when, when somebody is talking about core values and it's just because most companies' core values are just words up on a wall. They aren't truly living, breathing, hiring, firing, rewarding, reviewing by the core values. And your core values are, are the highest level of expectations that you have in the company. And I mean, we do this so much and I'll share with you when we do our quarterly conversations, we grade our team members on, are they living the core values? Like, plus you're living it, plus minus, sometimes you're living it, minus you're not living this core value at all. And it really should guide everybody's behavior in, in the company. And um, I think for, for some schools, that do have core values, they, they might have just picked in a couple of words that really spoke to them. There's a great exercise that you can go through. It's from the book Traction by Gino Wickman. And he walks you step by step because there is a process that you should go through. And it starts with, I want you to think of, you know, people that you really look up to, that you admire, that you would love to work with. And what are the characteristics that they have? And you can even do this for the current team members that you have. And you start making a list of all of those characteristics of all these different people. And what you'll start noticing is what I call green tails. You'll start seeing uh, commonalities in each one of those. And that's really where your core value decision on what the core values are going to be should start. So if you haven't gone through that process, check out the book Traction by Gino Wickman. But your core values need to be known by all. They need to be followed by all. There should be visuals. So yes, they should be up on the wall. They should be somewhere where the team can see it and, and they can point to it. And we, we hire by these. How do we hire by them? We share our core values before we even hire somebody. We share a video explaining the core values and we ask them which core value aligns the most with you. We fire by them and we use that rating system that we'll dive into more. When we are reviewing and we're rewarding our team, anytime we're doing shout outs in our meetings, we always try to tie it to a core value. So this is the first way that you set expectations. The second way is with your core focus. And this is also known as a brand promise or your, your mission statement. So ours at GrowPro is, is we give school owners the freedom to do what they love. So when we're making decisions in our business, we have to ask ourselves, is this going to give the school owner more freedom? Or is it actually going to put more on their plate? Because if it puts more on their plate, that's not aligned with our core focus. Then you set the expectations at the department level, okay? And this is really where the team lead has to not only be living by the core values and the core focus, right? We have to lead by example, okay? Um, but you have these expectations of what, what are the expectations of the instructor team? What are the expectations of the program director team? Maybe you have like an admin assistant or somebody that helps you at the front desk and then at the role. And this is why you got to have job descriptions, guys. For those of you that are starting to, to scale a team, um, it, it has to be in writing and it shouldn't just be some bullet pointed checklist. It should be an in-depth uh, you know, explanation of these are the expectations that we have in this role. And what we do on our job descriptions, which was a big unlock for us because our job descriptions were, were kind of lame in the past. And I found a really, really great template from a, a good friend of mine that owns an agency. And on the job descriptions, we have what the expectations are daily. Like, what are the things that you are expected to do on a daily basis, right? Then what are the expectations on a weekly basis? Because there are certain things that we're not going to do every day, but we are going to do weekly. What are the expectations monthly? And then what are the expectations quarterly? And another thing that we implemented, my program director and, and my head instructor, they use time blocking. And this is something that we sat down together and we said, okay, let's look at your job description and all of the expectations that we have on a daily, weekly, monthly, and base uh, and, and quarterly basis. How can we build a day-to-day -day time block for you to be able to successfully uh, do your role? 
So these are the four ways that you can set expectations in your school. And it doesn't matter what type of business that you have. It all works the same. Core values, core focus, department, and role. And they've got to be written down, guys. You've got to get them out of your head, and they've got to be written down. So I want you to just take a second right now. I want you to rate yourself. On a scale of one to five, one, you're a white belt at setting expectations. Five, you are a black belt at setting expectations. And just take a second, and hopefully you're taking notes, because if, if you don't write it down, you're not going to remember it, guys. Um, so go ahead, rate yourself one to five. And if you would love to, sh I'd, I'd love if you could, if you, if you felt comfortable sharing, there we go. We got some people sharing. We got some twos, some ones, some twos, a four. Awesome. It's important that we reflect on this, right? Um, doing, you know, daily reflections, weekly reflections are, are a great way for us to see where we're at and can let us know what, what we should do moving forward. All right. Awesome. Very good. So, Core principle number one of managing a team, you've got to be able to set expectations and they got to be written down. The second one, the A word, the accountability word. And um, I'm really excited to, to share tactical things that, that you can implement. So for expectations, if you're scoring yourself low, you got to get your core values. You got to get a core focus. You have to get those job descriptions and set them at the departmental level and at the role level. That's the tactical stuff that you need to do. Accountability is basically how you're doing versus how you are supposed to be doing. That's all it is. Like, this is how you're doing. This is how you're supposed to be doing. And in some cases, there's a very, very small gap or maybe no gap at all. And in other cases, there's a large gap. And feedback through communication is how we close that gap. That's all feedback is. It's a way of getting us from where we are to where we want to be. And, you know, like if you want an official definition, the, the quality or state of being responsible for your actions. And, you know, we throw this like CEO term around chief executive officer. And what you really need to be is a chief accountability officer. So, if you are currently experiencing maybe low revenue in your school, low enrollment, you're not hitting your upgrade nomination numbers or your upgrade um, you know, enrollment numbers or your renewals, if you have a high attrition, anything above 5%, guys, that is, that is a, a, a sensor that's going off like, hey, we got to focus on lowering the attrition. And the attrition is just the percentage of students that you are losing every month. 5% is the industry standard. So if you are above 5%, probably are lacking some form of accountability. There was this really cool study that was done in, in the fitness industry. And they took a group of people over the holidays, the Christmas holidays, right? Where everybody's giving you gifts. I know all of you get gifts from your students and it's cookies and candy and hot cocoa and all of those things, right? So oftentimes it it can be easy to increase our caloric intake during the holiday break. And they took two different groups of people and they said, group number one, what we want you to do is just step on a scale every morning and write down what your weight is. That's all you got to do. Wake up in the morning, step on the scale, write down what your weight is. Group number two, they just said, do, do whatever you normally do during the holidays. So they did not get the instructions of stepping on the scale. Over the course of the few weeks of the holidays, they came back and group number one was down 1.9 pounds and group number two that wasn't stepping on the scale was up 4.9 pounds. The only difference was they asked group number one to step on the scale and write it down. And the reason why I tell you this is because you are the scale, right? The scale gives us feedback. It gives us data. It lets us know how we're doing. You are the scale for your team. And this is how we are able to start holding them accountable. So what's the tactical way of doing this? Well, number one, we talked about the expectations. You got to have your values and you got to have the job description. Kind of hard to hold somebody accountable with something that you've never put down in writing. I mean, we even have our team members sign off on their job descriptions when we onboard them. So you got to have expectations. And then there has to be some form of measurement. And we do this through KPIs. We call it a scorecard. And we do a weekly meeting with our team. 
And there are numbers that they have to report. There's specific numbers that the instructor has to report, specific numbers that the program director has to report, specific numbers that the the, uh, owner has to report, because the numbers tell us a story in our business. And if you are the instructor and we have set the expectation that you are supposed to be sending out, um, let's say, 10 good job postcards a week, right? Just making up a random, random KPI here. And we go to the meeting and you tell me you only sent out two or you sent out zero or you sent out seven. Okay, well, those numbers are telling me a story that you are not following through on the expectations that we agreed to. So your full timers should have a scorecard. Esteban, this is fired. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. And then you got to give them feedback. You got to tell them. Tell them how the expectations and the measurements are going. Set the expectations. Ask them to give you a measurement. And you guys as a team will determine what those KPIs are. And then you give them feedback on it. And this is how you hold people accountable. But if you don't have the core values and you don't have job descriptions, if you're not requiring team members to report numbers, and then you're not discussing this with them on where we're at and where we want to go, you're not going to be able to hold them accountable. Okay. So what can we also do to improve accountability? Let's say, you know, the numbers aren't where they need to be. Often in in the martial arts industry, we talk a lot about praise in public and correct in private. And I do believe this with my employees as well. In the past, when I was more of a dictator, I would I would ream into them in front of everybody. You think you, you think that makes them feel good? You know, most people want to do a good job, guys. If they're a great culture fit, they want to do a good job. They don't want to disappoint themselves. They don't want to disappoint you. And in most cases, if they're a high culture fit. They're going to feel bad enough that they're not hitting whatever the KPIs are that you've set out. So we do this with having one-on-ones, okay? Now, how often should you have the one-on-one? It depends on the size of the company and your team, right? When you start scaling and you start having, I think, you know, somebody on here has 17 employees, like you're not going to, it's going to be very difficult for you to have one-on-ones every single week, but maybe you can delegate the one-on-ones to somebody that oversees that department. Maybe you delegate the one-on-ones to the chief instructor for the level one or level two instructors. And in these one-on-ones, is if there is low performance, this is when you tell them. So why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? I bet every single person on this call has a conversation that you want to have with somebody, whether it's you know a personal relationship, a family member, a friend, an employee, and we have this fear of having these conversations. And oftentimes we like play the absolute worst case scenario in our head over and over again. And then when we finally have the conversation, we feel this huge weight lifted off of our shoulders. And we're like, why in the world didn't I have that conversation sooner? Can anybody relate to that? Give me a yes in the comments. Am I the only one that, you know, has like had turmoil in my head over and over and over again? And you have the conversation and you're like, oh my gosh, why didn't we just do this sooner? And the reason why we don't do it is because we avoid things that we're naturally bad at. And man, the public school system, they had me dissect the frog. They taught me the Pythagorean theorem. There were no classes on how to communicate properly. Probably a pretty important class for people to learn. And the answer is what I have found in having clearing conversations. And this is the tactical items, right? So we we said earlier, you got to set the expectations. You got to have a KPI that you are holding them accountable for. And then you got to give them feedback. And you can do that if it's low performance in the one-on-ones. But how do we have that conversation? And, um, you know, there are certain gifts that people can give you in your life. And this was a gift that one of my mentors, his name is Gerardo. Um, he's actually our EOS implementer. He gave me this gift. And I will forever be grateful that he taught me this clearing model conversation because it is a way to have, quote unquote, hard conversations. And we don't even like using the terminology hard conversation. We call it a clearing conversation because we want to clear the air. And I don't think many of us have been taught like a framework, a step-by-step that if you do have to have a clearing conversation, this is the best way to do it so that you both are in agreement. 
Okay. So the first step is you just state the facts and just facts are things that you see with your, with your eyes. Okay. They're, they're, it's not a hunch. It's a fact. And when I go into a clearing conversation, I write this out beforehand. I think that if you don't put your thoughts down on paper, um, you can allow your emotions, especially if it's a, a sensitive topic, to get in the way. And then you don't really get what you really wanted to say out. So I write this down. These are the facts. And then I say, and this is very important because language matters, guys. The story in my mind is... Okay. When you say the story in my mind, it shows that this is, you know, my story from my perspective. I think we all could agree that we could all watch a, a, a scenario happen and have two completely different perceptions of what was going on. So the story in my mind is this. And then you got to get vulnerable. And I think this is very difficult in the martial arts industry. We you know, kind of have this like alpha machismo, like, you know, don't show your feelings. We're supposed to be strong and be able to fight. Anytime I've gotten vulnerable with my team, there has been a beautiful outcome on the other side of it. So I share, these are my feelings. This is how it makes me feel. Okay. So you state the facts. This is the story in my mind. These are my feelings. And then finally, these are my expectations moving forward. And then you have to give the other person an opportunity to do this. And this is a staple of, of the way that we communicate in our company. We have this uh, graphic here blown up in our conference room. And we have done trainings with our team on how to communicate when we need to have these clearing, a.k.a. hard conversations. And I use this in my marriage. I use this with conversations with my older children. And it has been just one of those, you know, game changing frameworks that we have implemented in our company because your company is always going to have problems and challenges and, and things you're going to have to overcome. People are never a box you just get to check off in your business, right? We have like this to do list, like you never just get to check off the box that says people, okay? And if you can train your team on how to properly communicate with each other through using a framework, it makes holding them accountable a lot easier. Okay. So I'd love just maybe just for a second, what was your, what was your main takeaway with this? Let me know uh, in the comments, any takeaways from this? Um, maybe it was, you know, the, the language of using the story in my mind, maybe it's, yeah, you know, I, I don't really get vulnerable with my team because I think sometimes people look at vulnerability as a potential weakness, which it's not, it's actually a superpower that you can have, but any takeaways from this, the story in my mind doesn't equal facts, clearing model, clear process. Awesome. Be human, be vulnerable. Clarity is power. Like the clear steps. Awesome. Thanks so much guys. So, this is a tactical thing that you can implement to help hold people accountable and make hard conversations not as hard. And then we have what we call quarterly conversations. And you should be reviewing your team members. Do you guys review your students when it's time for them to earn stripes and earn belts? Of course you do, right? It's a, it's a feedback loop. It shows them where are you progressing? Where do you need help? You need to be doing this with your team as well. And we changed the language from a quarterly performance review because sometimes people freak out like quarterly performance review. I got to do this four times a year. We changed it to quarterly conversations because language matters. And you guys, we're going to send the recording out and you'll get access to these slides. So you'll have it. But this is a breakdown of our quarterly conversations. This is the one for Gracie Pack. It has our core values on there. We ask them what's an accomplishment or something they're proud of. What core value did they highlight this year? Um, and then this is where we rate them on the core values. Lead. We lead from the front. Is this person leading from the front? If 80% of the time they are, they'll get a plus. 50% plus minus. Anything less than 50% of minus. If we have a minus, man, we've got to do some drastic changes. We will not accept two minuses in a row, two quarters in a row. You will no longer be on the team. So we rate them, but we don't rate them first. We ask them to rate themselves. And you know what's interesting, guys? And I've seen this time and time again. Your rock stars, your A players, 
will often rate themselves lower than what you rate them. And you're not rock stars, your C players, your B players, they will often rate themselves higher than what you rate themselves. It's very interesting. We've seen this over and over and over again. We then go over the top five roles. So on their job description, like these are the top five. It's not the only thing you're responsible, but these are the top five things that you're responsible for. And we ask them what's working, what's not working. You should be asking for feedback from your team because this is how you're going to be able to become a better leader and manager, and you're going to be able to make the company better. If there are any resources for improvement, maybe there's a book we want them to read, or there's a podcast we want them to listen to, or, hey, we'd really like for you to come to the next Maya event. You're going to write that in. If they had any projects for the quarter, we, uh, we put that in. We do let them know what their current PTO total is so that they're aware of how much PTO they've had. And then any questions and comments. And um, this, we actually are going through it right now in July because it's the start of the new quarter. And, uh, you know, we do, we have to do this 34 times. Well, nobody does it with me, but we have to do it 33 times with all of our team members. And it's one of the most powerful things you can do. And what's also great is you're going to get some really positive feedback of, of what's working well in the company. And also, where do we have room for improvements? This is how you hold people accountable. What is considered a rock? A rock would be a project in the school. So for example, um, maybe you are deciding to switch CRMs. That's not something that can happen in a day or a week. I mean, it, it can take a while to switch a CRM. That's a big project. Maybe you want to do some aesthetic upgrades to the school, and there's a project that has to go with that. Maybe you need to completely revamp your inventory in your school because whatever inventory process or lack thereof you have isn't working. It's something that is going to be kind of outside of the normal day to day and something that can't just be done in a week or a, 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 you know, a, a couple of days. Okay, hopefully that clears that for you. Cool. Rate yourself accountability one to five. Rate yourself accountability. Are you setting the expectations? Do you have metrics in place, KPIs, and are you giving them feedback? And is it consistent? It's not just every once in a while, guys. There has to be a meeting rhythm that you have with your team. Miss Kennedy, nice to see you. Threes, fours, twos, twos, threes. Awesome. Keep them coming, guys. Very important that we reflect on where we're at. There's no judgment zone here, okay? The non-judgment zone. All right, number three, communication. How do we communicate? Communication at the end of the day is us trading our assumptions for curiosity and actively listening to others on the team. Actively listening, okay? It's the bridge between ignorance and understanding. And I just want you to think about this. Like, has anyone ever quit a job because the boss over communicated? Like, it just doesn't happen. People leave because there is under communication or communication isn't happening. Happening, And your job as a leader is you are the one that sets the tone for what great communication really is. And when we implemented the clearing model, I was the first one to do it. And I did it with a team member and I taught them how to do it. And the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. We're in our heads all day long, guys, right? We see, maybe we see an instructor go to take out the trash and they're dragging the trash on the floor. So what happens? It leaves like a streak of mess on the floor and we see it and we think in our head like, what, why can't they just pick up the trash bag? Like, why, why, did, why do they have to take it out that way? And then we see them do it again. And then we see them do it again. And you're communicating this in your own head to yourself. Maybe you're even complaining to somebody else, your spouse about it but you don't communicate with the person. That is the biggest problem with communication is that there is an illusion that it has taken place. So there was this amazing study done by MIT and they wanted to see the effects of communication on a business. This is probably one of my all time favorite studies. So they took 30 businesses and everybody in the company, they made them wear a badge over their, it was like a lanyard with a badge over their neck. And what the badge did is it tracked their comms. How often are they communicating? And they were just trying to figure out, is there a correlation between communication and success in a business? 
And if there is a correlation, like what are the behaviors that create success? And what they found was that communication in itself was a greater predictor of success than individual intelligence or skill level of the team. What? Like, you don't have to have the smartest team. You don't have to have the most talented team. But if your team has great communication, that is a greater advantage to be successful. But how often are we training our team on how to have great communication? Probably not very often. So in this study, and and before I dive into it, um, this is one of my absolute favorite quotes. It's by Tim Ferriss. He read the book, The 4-Hour Workweek. Um, and he has a phenomenal podcast. And he says, a person's success in life can usually be measured by the number of uncomfortable conversations he or she is willing to have. It's the conversations you don't want to have where the biggest breakthroughs are. I just absolutely love that because I've experienced this. I've experienced where a relationship, uh, whether it be with an employee or, you know, in my personal life is on the rocks. And it's just because I was like, didn't want to have this uncomfortable conversation, right? Guys, like, let me get vulnerable with you here. For those of you that have been following me for a few years, what did I always have on my head? I always wore a what? A hat. Always wore a hat. I got 30 hats right now. I have not worn a hat since I cut my hair. Do you know one of the reasons why I waited so long to cut my hair was because I didn't want to have the conversation with my mother. My mother is Spanish. She's always told me since I was a little girl, you know, Spanish women, you have long, beautiful hair. You should never cut your hair. I didn't want to have that uncomfortable conversation. So I waited 30 years. I've wanted to cut my hair since I was like nine years old. I waited 30 years to do this thing because of this uncomfortable conversation. And I finally just had it and I cut my hair. And now when I look in the mirror, I finally feel like I am me. How crazy is that? Most of us have some something like this where we are just putting off this uncomfortable conversation. And I had the conversation, this huge weight lifted off my shoulders. I went that day, cut my hair, and, you know, I, so I, I like it. I'm digging it. Got to have the conversations, okay? So, four ways or, or four things that make great communication, energy, engagement, emotional control, and exploration. So let's talk about like, okay, what does that look like in real practice? Number one, energy, the number of exchanges with your team in and out of work. And it could be verbal exchanges. It could be nonverbal, like a high five, a fist bump, a wink, a smile. Those are all nonverbal ways to communicate. And then there are verbal ways, whether uh, you know, it could be written digitally, whether you send them a Slack message or an email or a text message. It could be in person. It could be liking their social media, commenting their social media. Every time one of my team members posts that they're in the gym, I'm in there. I'm, I'm communicating with them, tagging them on social, right? Thumbs up, faces that you make. So the number of exchanges that you have is part of what makes great communication. And then you have the engagement aspect, which is the distribution of energy to your team. And we all have A employees. We all have B employees. We all have C employees. And oftentimes, it's the employees that aren't performing as well that we don't necessarily uh, try to engage with as, as much. We typically focus on employees um, that we really like. We just get along with better. And you got to you gotta make sure that that distribution of energy is going to everybody on the team. What also makes great communication is emotional control. And this is why anytime I'm having a clearing conversation, I write down my thoughts so that I don't allow my emotions to get in the way. How well can you and your team manage and control emotions? Okay, There's going to be conflict in your business. We want it to be healthy conflict. Right? How we're able to stay calm when we're handling communication issues and not reacting, not reacting emotionally. And it doesn't mean that you can't feel pissed off. Trust me. There are plenty of times where I come into work, 
Somebody does something and it pisses me off. I just don't project it. And then the final thing that makes great communication is exploration. And this is when your team engage outside of their core teams. And this is why I'm such a big fan of doing like quarterly out or, you know, you could do monthly outings. You could do quarterly outings with the team, um, making sure that they're communicating well together, cross training. Like, do your instructors really know what the program director does? Do they really know? Does the program director really know what it's like to be an instructor? When you share that with them, they start having more empathy for each other because oftentimes like the instructor's like, oh, I'm running this place. Well, yeah, but people aren't going to, you know, we're not going to be able to pay bills if we're not signing up new people and, you know, doing all of the things that the program director has to do. So these are four things that make great communication, the number of exchanges. So I want you to think, like, are you doing a great job verbally and non-verbally with the ener- the amount of energy exchanges that are occurring with your team? Are you engaging with everybody on the team? Are you emotionally controlling yourself in maybe difficult situations? And are you ensuring that everybody on the team is communicating together, doing things like cross-training and shadowing, and also doing quarterly um, or monthly outings? So go ahead and rate yourself on communication. And as you rate yourself, Mr. McGraw, how far ahead of meeting do you ask employee to fill it out? Uh, So we keep the quarterly conversations in our Google Drive, which everybody has access to, so they can access it at any time. Um, But we, you know, when we schedule it, we schedule it about a week in advance. We'll tell them like, hey, make sure you put your thoughts down on paper for the quarterly conversation. Awesome. Keep the ratings coming in, guys. Cool. Okay. Next one, meetings. Meetings. You either love meetings or you hate meetings. And if you hate meetings, it's just because you're not good at meetings. So the meeting, the heartbeat of the team. But the problem with most meetings is that they don't have a clear purpose. There needs to be a reason why that meeting exists and why each individual needs to be there. I'm sure all of you have been in meetings before where you're thinking like, this just isn't relevant to me. Okay. How often should you do this, these meetings? I get this, this question all the time. Guys, there's no black and white answer with how often meetings should take place because it depends on the activity and the size of the company, right? If you have three employees versus having 23 employees, your meeting rhythm is going to be different. If you are maybe in like a cruise control setting right now and you're just kind of comfortable and content, you might not have as many meetings as a company that maybe is like trying to do a J curve and skyrocket up, Okay. I um, I personally love meetings because we have a really, really great meeting agenda, which we'll talk about in a second. But what makes a meeting useful is preparation. If we're going into a meeting and we're going to be covering stats, we're not looking up the stats during the meeting. The stats should have been looked up beforehand, should have been written down somewhere, whether it's pen and paper or spreadsheet or wherever. And, and what I don't want you to do is go into the meeting, oh, yeah, the numbers are on the CRM. When they ask me how many enrollments, I'll just look in the CRM. No, that's going to take time. It's not efficient. We all have curriculum and lesson plans, correct? Let me know, yes or no. Do you use a curriculum and lesson plan in your martial arts school? Let me know in the comments, please. Yes or no? You have curriculum and you have lesson plans for your students. You should have a lesson plan or a curriculum for your meetings. And what makes a great meeting is having the proper information, uh, the proper information and data, plus the proper people that need to be in there, and then an agenda. That's what you need. You need the data, you need the right people, and you need an agenda. Okay. I did a full free webinar on all of the different meetings that we host in our company. I went through our annual meeting, which is a one to two day meeting. Went over our quarterly meetings, which take about four to six hours. Went over our weekly level 10 meeting, which is an hour long meeting. And then I went over our weekly one-on-one rhythm. So like owner to the leadership team and leadership team to the team members. And these are quick, just 15 minute check-ins. And then I also went over daily huddles, like just a five to 10 minute check-in that your program director, your instructor should be doing before uh, you know the craziness of 4 p.m. hits. So if you're struggling with your meetings, um, I would definitely recommend checking out that webinars. You can you can find it on our GrowPro website, growpro.com forward slash webinars. I've done, I think, about 50 webinars over the last few years, one every single month. 
And if you want to learn more about doing a great meeting, because we could literally go on for hours about this, definitely go check that out. But I want you to just think now, what what is the meeting rhythms that you have? Are you doing something weekly? Is it consistent? And guys, if you are a one man and one woman show, do you think you should still have meetings? Yes, with yourself. You need to have a specific time where you're going to sit down and you're going to go through the numbers. You're going to go through the issues. You're going to have thinking time on how to overcome that. So take a second, and I want you to rate yourself on your meeting rhythms. One to five, how are you doing? Awesome. Cool. All right. So we all have some room for improvement. Last up, recognition. This is the fun one. Last up, recognition. When we see somebody whose behavior supports the company's goals and values, that is when it's time to recognize and acknowledge them. Recognition should emphasize behavior. And it should be specific. It shouldn't just be good job. Maybe you see one of your instructors doing a sniper chat with one of the parents after class. A sniper chat is just a quick check-in, 30 seconds with the parents, giving them feedback on how well Johnny did, or in some cases, maybe some room for improvements. And maybe you, you walk by and you overhear this conversation. That supports your company goals because that's going to help with retention and keeping your students longer and increasing their lifetime value. More than likely, that level of communication with the parent is probably going to fall into one of your core values in your school. You need to recognize that because when you recognize the behavior and you give them a high five or you get very specific, like, oh, man, I really loved how you stepped off and, you know, you called Mr. Smith by his appropriate title and you were very specific on, you know, uh, praising Johnny because he was being a really great team member to a boy that was struggling with the technique. That is a behavior you want your team members to do over and over again. You got to recognize it. And when you recognize your people, you will reduce your turnover. It'll improve your culture, your profitability, the engagement, and it will also help you attract other top talent to your schools. You got to recognize, guys. And we, we typically do a really great job of this with our students, but are we doing it with our employees and how consistent are we? So when should you recognize? When an outcome occurs, right? If there was a completion or a project or a goal, like, man, all right, we, we knocked that project out of the park, checked it off. An effort, maybe the behavior that, that achieves the result. Maybe we have like a long project. Like I said, maybe you're trying to redo your inventory process. And part one of the process was researching maybe new cubbies. And they were able to give you three different options for cubbies with three different price points. Like, that is a, a project that might take a really long time, but they're putting in the effort to help us get closer. They're hitting those milestones. Milestones such as their birthday and their work anniversary. Guys, you got to celebrate that. It doesn't mean that it needs to cost you any money. A simple card, a handwritten card on somebody's birthday or their work anniversary is incredibly powerful. Now, we do have specific things when it is somebody's birthday. Um on their job application that they're they're filling out, we ask them what their favorite treat is and what their favorite drink is. And on their birthday, we give them to that. So maybe like they said, Twizzlers and a Diet Coke. Maybe, you know, not the healthiest, but we said treat. So when they show up for their birthday, there's Twizzlers and a Diet Coke there. What does that cost us? Five bucks, right? We do larger items for anniversaries. Um, so on their one-year work anniversary, two-year, three-year, four-year, um, and we do that for, for full-time workers. We will acknowledge part-time workers, but we actually give a gift for full-time salaried employees. So the chief instructor, the senior instructor, the program director, um, and we have specific things. And it you know gets cooler and cooler the longest that they've been with us. And then anytime they're abiding by a core value, what should you do? It could be a formal recognition, something that is predetermined, right? Like the anniversary that's predetermined, the birthday that's predetermined. It can be spontaneous, let me tell you the power of a handwritten card that comes from the owner just out of nowhere, not on a birthday, not on a work anniversary, but just because, right? For those of you that are in relationships, how does that feel when your spouse leaves that kind of just because post-it note, right? When I travel, sometimes my wife will put a card in there and I, uh, you know, I get to the hotel room and I open up my luggage and I see it and it just absolutely warms my heart. 
So it could be handwritten. It could be gifts. It could be company, uh, you know, swag. It could just be a shout out in a meeting. Okay. How should you do it? You can do it written. Okay. You can put it on social media. That's one of one of the best social media organic campaigns that you can put out is highlighting your team members. They get the absolute best engagement on social media. Uh, it could be verbal in meetings. So in a group meeting, if we want to praise somebody or in a one-on-one. -on -one. And then it could be an actual reward, right? Whether that's a bonus or a, a planned activity. Um, I have one of our team members is really, really great with graphic design. And sometimes I'll I'll give her some kind of side quests that uh, are outside of her normal role. And I recently had her do this for me and I found out what her favorite restaurant was and I gave her a $150 gift card to go to the restaurant, okay? So it could be an actual reward. The one major takeaway I want you to remember is that recency beats intensity. Just because you decide, okay, we're gonna get them a birthday card and you know maybe we'll you know get them something on their anniversary. Like that's only gonna happen twice a year, right? Once on the anniversary and once on the birthday. The recency of the recognition, the recency of the shout outs, the verbal, the posting on social media, the high fives, the fist bumps, the specific praise that you give them either one-on-one -on -one or in a meeting setting, that is what is most important. It has to be recent. Now, it has to be earned, guys. I'm not telling you to you know, give a good job just to give a good job. It has to be earned. But recency beats intensity with recognition. One of the things I'm, I'm well known for, it was actually the very first time that I ever spoke to the martial arts industry at Steven Reinstein's Market Muscle event back in 2019, is I talked about the customer journey that our customers go through. There's six stages that all of our customers go through. And there's also stages that your employees go through. So we actually turned our customer journey into an employee journey. And this employee journey has those same six stages. Like how do we get how do we get potential new hires aware that we're hiring or that who our company is? How do we get them to consider working for us? What does the hiring process look like? Then how do we onboard them? How do we keep them? And how do we turn our employees into advocates of our company? And this is something that you absolutely should have for your customer base. But when you start growing a team, you need to start looking at how can I serve my team members at each one of these stages as well. So I'd love to know on a scale of one to five, recognition, rate yourself. How are you doing with recognizing your team? Seeing some higher numbers this time. I like that. Awesome. You guys, those are the four, uh, the, the five core principles, expectations, okay? The tactical stuff, got to have the job description, got to have the core values, okay? Um, the accountability, this is implementing clearing conversations. If you have to have hard conversations, this is making sure your team members are responsible for KPIs, and this is giving them feedback based off of it. Uh, the communication, so, you know, acknowledging the amount of communication you're doing with each team member, the type, is it verbal, is it nonverbal, uh, are you spreading the wealth with that, are you controlling your emotions, and are you creating an environment where it's easy for your team to communicate. We've got the meeting rhythms, which I gave you a resource if you want to dive deeper, but I truly believe no matter what size of the company, you need to have an annual meeting, you need to have quarterly meetings, and you need to have weekly meetings, okay? Um, and then in the martial arts industry, like your, your instructor and your program director should just have a quick five, 10 minute stand up meeting every day before classes start. So they're all on the same page. But if you want to dive deeper, check out that webinar. And then we talked about recognition, right? When do we recognize? What can we do? How do we do it? Um, and just remembering that recency beats intensity. So it is not a dumb question, Mr. James. KTI stands for Key Performance Indicator. So it is a, a data number in your business that uh, is going to tell you how the business is doing. So like Key Performance Indicator, the number of leads that come in, the number of appointments that you book, the, um, you know, your attendance numbers, right? We have 100 active count. How many of that active count are showing up every week? Those are Key Performance Indicators. It's a great question. Okay, I'd love to know, biggest takeaway, what's the one area that you need to focus on as we wrap up here? Let me know in the comments, guys. It's my feedback loop to see if you were picking up what I was putting down. Hopefully you found some value 
in today's training session. Got to be on paper. Yes, sir, Mr. McGraw. If it's not on paper, doesn't doesn't count. In your head, doesn't count. Mr. Smith, we got to get some meetings. Very good. The expectations at the job description. Expectations written down. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. All of this is in your head. And guys, that you're going to feel so relieved once you get it out of your head. It's going to feel so, so good. And, and here's the thing. For those of you that might have aspirations of opening up multiple locations, this stuff's got to be written down on paper so you can rinse and repeat it. Okay. Better meeting structure, clearing conversations, written out expectations. Awesome. Absolutely had a blast with you guys today. 